Hey there, historians! We're back in India, an ancient civilization with thousands of years of history in South Asia. Today we're focusing on one brief but very important moment in that long history. The moment in the 18th century when Great Britain, a nation of 5 million people, came along and decided that India, a nation of 300 million, should be the jewel in the crown of the British Empire. That's right, historians. The British looked over at India, a subcontinent more than six months away by ship, saw its immense value and thought, that really should belong to us. And so, like a true imperial power, they took it. But at what cost to the Indian people? That's what we aim to find out today. Our guiding questions are, why were the British interested in India? How did they gain control of it? And what were some early signs of Indian resistance? Our big picture question is, what were the consequences of British dominance in India? So why would the British want anything to do with India, a place thousands of miles away from them on the other side of Africa? The simple answer is money. To understand just how much money, let's rewind the clock a bit and recall a guy named Francis Drake. No, not that guy. That guy. Drake was the 16th century British privateer, which is a polite way of saying he was a pirate with the Queen's permission to attack enemy ships and keep their cargo as payment. In 1579, after plundering a slew of Spanish galleons along the South American coast, he sailed across the Pacific to the Indian Ocean and came upon a place called the Moluccas, also known as the Spice Islands. There he met a guy called Sultan Babula, who agreed to give him a huge haul of exotic spices, like clove and nutmeg, in exchange for linens and some plundered gold. When Drake returned to Britain, he was met with high demand for his spices, the sale of which helped make his investors very, very rich. How rich? 5,000% richer than they were before his journey. Soon a group of salivating British merchants formed the British East India Company, a joint stock company, that is, a business enterprise made up of shareholders who each own a small piece or share of the company, whose purpose was to capitalize on the lucrative spice, silk, and tea trades in the East Indies. By 1690, the company had established trading posts in the Indian cities of Surat, Bombay, and Calcutta, and had even secured a land grant in Madras. The East India Company would soon grow into the largest and most powerful corporation on earth, complete with its own army, its own territory, and a practical stranglehold on the worldwide tea trade. From the British point of view, India had become a critical source of goods and raw materials, like cotton needed in the Industrial Revolution, and its 300 million people were increasingly seen as a huge potential market for British goods. Pause here and write down your answer to our first guiding question. Why were the British interested in India? If you wrote something like to trade for valuable goods, obtain raw materials, and establish new markets for British products, you're absolutely right. By the beginning of the 18th century, the once powerful Mughal Empire that ruled most of the Indian subcontinent for two centuries was in rapid decline. Dozens of small Indian states, each led by a local ruler, began breaking away from Mughal control. These local leaders tended to welcome the British, not just because many of them profited immensely from their dealings with the East India Company, but also because they were largely left alone to govern without foreign interference. That began to change in 1757, when a guy called Robert Clive led the East India Company's private army, made up mostly of sepoys, that is, Indian soldiers serving under British orders, against the forces of local Bengali leader Siraj Udawla and his French allies at the Battle of Plassey near Calcutta. Clive defeated Siraj Udawla, who was betrayed by his former commander Mir Jafar and installed Jafar as puppet leader in Bengal to rule on behalf of the East India Company. Over the next hundred years, the British took control of the rest of India, either through direct possession of land or through a system of indirect rule. 
Indirect British rule in India meant that local rulers were left in charge within their own princely states, but these rulers would often have to give up control of their external affairs and of taxation in exchange for the protection of the British government. Pause here and write down your answer to our second guiding question. How did the British take control of India? If you wrote something like, they would either own Indian land and rule it directly, or they would leave local leaders in charge and control them indirectly through the promise of protection by the British government, <laughs> you nailed it. As the British increased their foothold in India, they built a huge railroad network to transport raw materials and forced Indian farmers to switch to the production of cash crops like jute and indigo to be used in the British textile industry. They also began requiring Indians to buy British goods while at the same time prohibiting them from competing with British manufacturing. So when Britain flooded the Indian market with cheap machine-made clothes, often made with Indian raw materials, India's local handmade textile industry was driven out of business because it couldn't compete. Indians began to feel resentment, not just because of Britain's economic control, but also because of its overt racism and attempts to impose Christianity on the Indian people. In 1857, rumors spread among Hindu and Muslim sepoys in the garrison town of Meerut that their new rifle cartridges were greased with beef and pork fat. To use the cartridges, soldiers had to bite off both ends. Why was this a problem? Because Hindus consider cows sacred and Muslims don't eat pork. The sepoys were furious. Nearly all of them, Hindu and Muslim alike, refused to use the new cartridges. The British commander jailed those who disobeyed. The next day, the sepoys rebelled and marched to Delhi, where they joined with the other Indian soldiers and captured the city. From there, the rebellion spread to northern and central India, with intense clashes for more than a year between British and Indian forces. Ultimately, the British government sent reinforcements to crush the sepoys, who struggled to unite due to weak leadership and infighting between Hindus and Muslims. After the uprising, Britain took full direct control of India. A cabinet minister in London established policies, and a British governor-general in India, later known as the Viceroy, carried them out. Pause here and write down your answer to our third guiding question. What were some early signs of Indian resistance to British control? If you wrote something like the willingness of Indian troops to rise up in 1857 over mistreatment by their British commanders, you're right again. So, what were the consequences of British dominance in India? British government officials of the time might have pointed to the railroad network, modernized sanitation, and increased literacy as some of the positive consequences of their influence. The average Indian of the time might have taken a very different view, pointing to the restriction of Indian-owned industries, a loss of self-sufficiency due to mandatory cash crop production, and widespread famine as some of the negatives. Either way, the power structure imposed by the British essentially made Indians second-class citizens in their own country. Indians were prohibited from holding top civil service jobs, and for the mid-level jobs they were allowed to hold, they were paid far less than their British counterparts. All of this increased the distrust Indians felt toward British dominance and led to a growing sense of nationalism in India. Soon, two influential nationalist groups would form, the Indian National Congress and the Muslim League, concentrating at first on the specific concerns of Indians. Eventually, both organizations would begin calling for full self-government, but animosity between Hindus and Muslims, the two main religious groups they represented, would prove to be, as we'll see later, a major obstacle. In the meantime, historians, keep your eyes open because history is everywhere. Hey, hey.